Hi, and welcome back to Vermont Craft Tours. I'm Rick. And I'm Sarah. And today we have a slightly different uh, style of presentation for you guys. Um, we made a little field trip down to Salem last weekend and had some beer and saw some um, artwork and fiber related things. So we wanted to share that with you. Um, so we'll talk about the beer first. Uh, Rick, you picked out a place to go have lunch that had a nice selection. Yeah, we decided on the Salem Beer Works. Uh, often when we travel, we try to find a place that maybe has a fiber uh, organization or group, whether it's a knitting store or et cetera, or, and we always try to find a local brew pub. Mm -hmm. And this time I settled on uh, Salem Beer Works, um, mostly for their beer, but also because of the proximity to the museum we were visiting. Yeah, that was handy. Salem is one of those old towns that's, you know, every way is a one-way street and they're all narrow, so and not having to park multiple times was really good. Um, and we met up with some friends for lunch and uh, tried a couple of beers, um, one of which we brought back with us, which we'll taste in just a second. Um, but you had, to, you had picked a couple of beers to have with your lunch. Well, often when I go to a brew pub, especially if it's an extensive menu, I ask for help from the, uh, the server to mm -hmm. find out what they might recommend. I give them some guidelines, and that's a nice way to kind of find out what they might recommend. Um, in this case, I suggested I was looking for a New England style IPA, something was maybe a little citrusy, hop forward, but also not too strong in the alcohol levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, this waiter suggested the Contender IPA, mm -hmm. which was nice. It had a very nice orange complexion, it had a hint of citrus, and it had a nice balance of hops, uh, both for bitterness and for the flavor. And I was very pleased with the suggestion. Yeah, I thought so too. I only had a sip or two of it, but I remember um, liking it. It was definitely in that New England style, like you said, with the fruit forward. It wasn't real herbal or too heavy with the food that you were eating and um, went down nicely. It was delicious. Um, and the, uh, the one that I ordered um, was a porter, um, and we actually brought back a growler. This has been sitting in our fridge for a week. Um, that's held up pretty well, I think. Yeah. Um, so this is their excellent porter. Excellent porter. Mm-hmm. And perfectly it, named and it is excellent it's got a nice color on it um and the the bubbles have held up well in our growler the growler it was a wedding anniversary gift from sarah on a the sterling silver anniversary and it is coming quite handy in our travels stainless steel i think we haven't quite made it to sterling silver oh. <laughs> that's all right it's not the beer talking that was my first sip close enough close enough no but this is really good um it's a nice, uh, smooth porter. It does have some nice bitterness to it. It's it's sweet at first, but it, it becomes bitter as it sits on your tongue for a second. And I like that. I don't like beer that tastes too syrupy, even though I, I do sometimes like the maltier beers. Um, I like a nice balance, and I think this has that good roasty, more bitter malt quality to it. Right, that's exactly it. I get the bitterness, almost a coffee um, kind of undertones, a little nutty. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit chocolatey, but it finishes very dry. Yeah. Yeah. So and this also was really good. I had a fried chicken sandwich. Um, so this stood up to the kind of heavier, you know, fried meats, um, but didn't overpower the rest of the flavors in my meal. And uh, you've been sick all week, um, so you haven't been drinking the beers we brought back, but I've been kind of... Um, I wasn't sure if we were going to be telling that away. part of the story as to why it was so, took us so long to consume <laughs> this excellent beer. But yes, um, I didn't want to... Uh, well, I don't drink when I'm sick, but also I wasn't going to be able to appreciate the beer mm -hmm. quite as well. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, Sarah was nice enough to leave me some of it. A so. little bit, a little bit. So anyway, here's to your health. Glad you're Thank feeling you. better. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the main reason we went down to Salem on this particular weekend was um, they had a traveling exhibit on Georgia O'Keeffe, the artist. Um, and I had first found out about this, I think, on the Mason Dixon knitting blog. Um, if not that, some other big knitting blog. Um, and what I was drawn to with uh, wanting to go to see this exhibit is it wasn't just her paintings, um, which are beautiful, but it was a lot about her life, her presentation of herself as a person, um, her clothing, and kind of her whole lifestyle. And that was, that was pretty interesting to me. Um, what, what stood out for you at the exhibit? I was not familiar with uh, George O'Keefe beyond some of the kind of the orchids and the flowers, etc. that apparently was from her uh, later period when she, well, later part of her life, even though that may have still been 40 years, uh, that she spent in uh, the American Southwest. I was fascinated that her time in New York 
she wore very geometric, dark, black, mostly black or grayscale, and it reflected in her artwork at the time as well. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until that she moved out to the Southwest that she adopted a more colorful, although blue, almost exclusively blue, mm -hmm. patterned or color scheme for her, uh, for her. And I thought that was fascinating. Mm, in, her, in her dress. Yeah, she seemed to have two different modes. She had this very masculine mode that I guess, you know, uh, according to the exhibit we saw, that was kind of her her dress up clothes. She would wear suits, lots of very tailored things, um, but simple, kind of a la Coco Chanel or something, not not a lot of um, adornment. And then. Um, With a hint in, of some Asian influences, the, yes. the kimono almost style. Yes, to it. kimono sleeves on some of her, her things um, or, or little details on like collars and things. And then the other mode was her relaxed kind of Southwest, you know, just hanging out at home. Uh, thing with these very simple robe style dresses and like you said in bright colors oh, dungarees and blue shirts and right, very yeah. simple lines lots yeah. of denim um, yeah and it was it was interesting to me you know you got to see a little bit of the behind the scenes in the the exhibit but I think a lot of the focus was also on how she presented herself to the world <laughs> how she allowed herself to be photographed um, the poses she took the costumes she would wear and it reminded me kind of of Salvador Dali in that way. You know, he, he presented himself as a personality, as a character to go along with his surrealist artwork. Um, and in some ways, I think that was, she was doing a similar thing. She was presenting herself as a personality um, to go along with, you know, her art and aesthetic and, and, and to kind of get her name and her style recognized mm. more broadly. Mm. Um, and I was also fascinated that she also made a lot of her own clothes, at least in the beginning. And then, you know, when she became more famous and had more money, she would have them tailored. But she was very specific about her clothing, um, her materials. She really liked natural materials, silk and wool and cotton. Um, and again, would, would either buy ready-made clothes and then have them altered to her taste, or she would take a pattern that she liked and altered it. Um, and again, just had that really sense of, uh, her own style, not not copying anybody else. Yeah, yeah, even down to her painting aprons that were on display, it was something that may have been store bought, but then she would alter it by adding to it, making it longer. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like she would get things off the shelf, so to speak, once she was in the Southwest, but she always made it her, her own. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, and her jewelry and the way she did her hair, all the aspects of her look or her looks. Um, very thoughtfully planned out um, and towards the end of the exhibit you got to see also how she would decorate her house I think Life magazine and some of the other lifestyle magazines at the time Better Homes um, did some you know exposés on her uh, so her house her furniture her furnishings you know her, her floor coverings her sculptures um, she would collect these bones of cattle that had been bleached by the sun and, you know, artfully arranged them on her deck or, or in her living room or pose with them. And then um, eventually paint them. Yeah, and then work them into her painting. So it was, you know, I don't feel like I really have a personal style. I feel like I'm just starting to kind of develop that a little bit for myself. So it's interesting to me to see someone from a pretty young age have this, like, no, this is my look. This is what, you know, this is the kind of style I'm going for. And then to carry that through all the aspects of their life. Um, was interesting to me. Yeah. I wasn't uh, familiar with it, and I wanted to support Sarah and her interest. Again, this wasn't about the paintings. It was mostly about uh, the, uh, the textiles part of things. And mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I was uh, really happy to have attended and learned so much about her, uh, learn about her, her textile work, her earlier paintings that I was not familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, her time in New York, there's a lot of very straight lines. There's a lot of work done or about architecture. And that's something that mm -hmm. I do when I used to sketch and draw. Sharp lines, angles, depth of field were something that I was interested in. And also I was very interested in, uh, as Sarah said, how she allowed herself to be presented. For the longest time, she seemed to exclusively allow her husband, Al uh, husband Alfred, to photograph her and so mm -hmm. that was something that, that was fascinating and then after he passed away seeing how others captured her mm -hmm. yeah and her public image 
seemed to loosen up a little bit at that point. I guess he was really controlling about presenting her um, because they were in these influential artistic circles. Ha again, building that image of the artist um, in kind of very serious way. And then once she became more well-known and had already captivated America to see other people come in and present her more relaxed or a little more surreal or something like that was interesting. And I'm wondering if that was by design as well mm. for a woman in the 20s and 30s to be taken seriously as an mm. artist and not necessarily as an object herself. And mm -hmm. so presenting herself not in necessarily fashionable sense and mm -hmm. uh, flamboyant sense, maybe a la Salvador Dali, um, but more as to let my work speak for itself. Right. And in that, that time period, that early time period you were speaking of, that's when she was much more masculinely presented to. And I think I think you're right. I think that carried, especially then, still does, but carries a certain cultural weight. Like, this is very serious, and you should take me seriously and, yeah. and pay attention to the art and not worry about this plain black suit that I'm wearing. You know, I'm just a serious artist. And or, yeah, or the fact that I'm a woman. Me. Look right. past that, look at my work, let my work stand on its own, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that I really appreciated, especially for a person of that era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So um, I will, I, I meant to do some research before we started this video, but I will look and see um, that exhibit is closing the first week of April. So it's closing pretty soon. Um, if you have the ability to get to Salem before it closes, uh, please do it. It's at the Peabody Essex Museum right down the town in Salem. Um, but I'll see, it's a traveling exhibit, so we'll see where it's going next and put a link um, in the show notes to this episode. So hopefully it'll be coming to your area. Um, if not, we've included a few pictures for you, and I hope you've enjoyed those. So thanks for being with us this episode. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with anybody? Well, I just wanted to say is that, you know, we love Vermont in this uh, this. Uh video series is often about celebrating everything Vermont and I like to tell people that there's not a lot that you need outside of Vermont but sometimes some of the better things don't come to Vermont and mm -hmm. it is nice that we have the the ability to take a very short trip somewhere whether it's going mm -hmm. to Montreal and that's only three hours away or going to Salem and it's only two and a half hours away or Portland which is you know three to four hours away mm -hmm. there's it's really nice to be able to uh, visit other parts of New England um, and especially when it comes to some of the cultural things as far as museums are concerned. Right, yeah. We're, we're very lucky to be in this compressed eastern seaboard area. We can get up and down pretty easily. So, And we have friends up and down we can stay with. So, Yeah, so um, so grab a little culture if you can. Check and out a little and see, beer. see what's coming out in your area and certainly a little local beer. Yeah, thanks. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Thanks for being with us.